we're going to be talking about uh, cabinetry here next. And uh, this is a notebook talk, but we're starting uh, with a few slides just to set uh, a bit the general context. Um, so bint template fits with cabinetry. Um, there's a few uh, questions that uh, you might ask uh, first. So first, uh, bint template fits, why do we care about them? Uh, we use them widely at the LHC and beyond for statistical inference. In fact, we've just seen uh, in the previous talk, uh, PyHF presented, which is something we can use for bin template fits. And in fact, we'll uh, see it again here in this talk. And uh, there's one particular model that also Matthew described called Hist Factory that is used for bin template fits. Uh, there's a small set of building blocks defined in this model uh, that, uh, from which you can uh, construct probability density functions. Uh, even though there's a small set of building blocks, it actually does cover a very wide uh, range of use cases and it's extensively used in Atlas. Once you have a statistical model defined, you can serialize this to a so-called workspace. Now, the cabinetry library I'm talking about today, it's a Python library for operating uh, and for constructing hist factory models. Um, you can pip install it and we make heavy use of PyHF within cabinetry. Um, not only do we make use of PyHF, also um, of many of the other libraries in the Python uh, ecosystem, and uh, it's written to be modular, so you can use pieces of cabinetry that um, you might need, um, but you don't need to commit to the full thing if you don't want to. Now, working with cabinetry, um, there's two uh, main things for which you can use cabinetry. The first thing is you can use cabinetry to design and construct a statistical model. You do that from a declarative configuration, in which you specify things about your model in sort of in terms of physics. So you say, for example, what kind of phase space regions do I want to consider? What kind of samples um, do I need to consider? What physics processes uh, enter these phase space regions? And lastly, what kind of systematic uncertainties do I want to apply? Then cabinetry uses this information in that declarative configuration to steer the creation of template histograms. Um, there's many different template histograms you need in practice and cabinetry includes the logic to determine which are needed and sends th off those instructions to have uh, the template histograms built for you. With those histograms available, then it can build a hist factory workspace, your serialized fit model. And then with such a fit model at hand, no matter whether you build it with cabinetry or not, you can go ahead and perform statistical inference. And cabinetry makes your life easier because it includes diagnostics and visualization tools so that you don't just get back a couple of numbers from a fit, but you can also take a look at them in familiar formats. If you want to design a statistical model, you do that by writing a configuration for this model um, in a declarative manner. The, dec uh, the configuration can be done uh, either in JSON or in YAML. Or it can also be a Python dictionary, which we'll see uh, in the notebook section um, in a bit. And it specifies everything needed to build a workspace. There's an example here in YAML format um, shown at the bottom. And uh, the idea behind this uh, schema is that you can uh, capture the potentially quite complex interplay between different phase space regions, different samples, and different systematics uh, in a concise way. There's different blocks here of this configuration. Um, shown in this example, we'll have a closer look at that um, in a bit when we uh, talk about this uh, in our example in the notebook that we're going through. So when we have a configuration available, what happens next is we want to create a workspace out of this, our fit model, uh, and that happens in three steps. First, cabinetry determines which template histograms are needed sends off the instructions to backends. By default, this is using Uproot. Um, there's also experimental coffee support um, to obtain the histograms. Then there's an optional post-processing step that uh, can be applied, for example, to uh, have additional smoothing applied. And then finally, everything is assembled into a workspace. In this case, we're using PyHF, and that workspace will be serialized as a JSON file. Uh, at this stage, there's already uh, visualization utilities available so that you can ensure you're building the correct workspace. Once you have this model available, uh, cabinetry can be used to steer statistical inference. And there's many different visualizations that uh, come with that. You see some examples here, parameter correlations, pulls of nuisance parameters, uh, likelihood scans, uh, upper limits for parameters, ranking parameters by their impact on the parameter that you actually care about. Everything is validated um, against uh, implementation based uh, on root. So where's cabinetry going next? Um, it's under active development and everything I'm showing you here today is available. And in fact, uh, you don't just need to believe that I'm saying this because we'll see in a second in the notebook, which you can follow along that um, all of this is working already. Um, for the next steps uh, in the short term, uh, an overhaul of the visualization API uh, is planned so that figure handling um, is a bit more convenient and it's easier to customize figures. Histogram inputs instead of just columnar data as inputs are another topic uh, that comes up um, quite frequently. You see here these linked GitHub issues if you want to read a bit more. 
Um, a more sort of technical topic is that we would like to uh, support models beyond just his factory in the future. There's an issue here as well. And in the longer term, uh, an important uh, thing that we would like to get working is end-to-end -end automatic differentiation. Uh, I'm not going into any detail in this talk today, but I point you to the NEOS project uh, and see also the related PyHub 2020 uh, talk um, if, you were, if you're curious about this. And you also might have other ideas. Um, and if you do so, please, um, you're very welcome. Your thoughts and contributions, just get in touch um, if you have any. So in summary, uh, for this very short intro, we have a Python-based library that allows you to create and operate statistical models. Uh, we make use of the Python high energy physics ecosystem to achieve that. Um, everything is on GitHub, and you can try it out yourself on Binder. And now we'll do exactly that. Um, I have here a notebook, which you'll find linked to the agenda with a link to Binder, and we'll go through this notebook now um, to see Cabinetry in action. Uh, the top cells here are just uh, installations if you don't run through Binder. If you run through Binder, you have all the environments set up already, uh, so don't worry about those. If you're running locally, you need a few packages. We start by importing Cabinetry. Um, Cabinetry uses the Python logging module um, to configure its output. Um, there is a function set logging, which we can use to set some sensible defaults for the logging, but you're welcome to customize this further according to your needs. There's a few other libraries that we're going to need, and we just import everything here uh, at the top um, all at once so that we have everything available for further down in the notebook. Okay, so what are we doing in this notebook today? We'll create a statistical model. We perform inference with it. Then we uh, actually look at a more realistic uh, model and we in fact take the model off an Atlas analysis um, and um, take a look at that one. And there's quite a bit of bonus material for you to look through in your own time. Um, that's uh, at the end of the notebook, which we won't have time to go through today in this talk. All right, let's start by creating a statistical model. As, as I was already saying in the slides, to create a model, we need to have a configuration that specifies our model. The first thing for a model that is needed is a few general settings. Um, so here's a few general things. We need to give everything a name that PyHF ultimately wants in the workspace that we're going to be building. We need to specify the thing we want to measure. In our case, let's say we want to measure the normalization of some signal process, and we call that parameter signal underline norm. We also need to specify where we find our input data. So these here are the end tuples, columnar input data. And you see, we find that in some folder that's called input. And then there's this sample paths thing here in curly brackets. We'll come back to this in one second, uh, why this is in curly brackets. So these are a few general things we need to specify. Um, then next, uh, it's going to be more uh, about physics. So let's say we need to specify now what our phase-based regions are from which we want to include events. In this example here, the, the regions is a list, as you can see. We only have a single one. You could add more if you wanted. We call it our signal region. We apply a filter. We say we only care about events with a positive lepton charge. And we use as our observable the jet PT with the binning with the bin edges as specified here. This is a toy example. You can play around with this. You can add an extra region um, if you'd like to see then how this further propagates throughout the notebook. So we have our phase space regions. Now, what populates those phase space regions? Um, there's different so-called samples. So one kind of sample that we have is our observed data. In this case here, in this toy example, this is actually a synthetic data set, so it's called pseudo data here, but this is typically what you observe in your detector. Uh, since data is treated specially, we need to give it a flag here so that we say this is data. There's also then different uh, processes, the collision processes, for example, that we expect to contribute. Here we have two of them. One of them we call our signal, the thing we want to measure, and then there's all our background. Here again, you see the sample parts appearing. Um, and you set that to some value here. So what's happening is we override the uh, setting that was given in the curly brackets, as you see uh, down here, what we set in our general settings, we said everything is in this input folder. And then the sample path setting here is overwritten by whatever we specify here so that we can specify samples in different locations. There's also weights that we can apply at this step per sample, um, for example, related to Monte Carlo integration. So here we have just three different samples. In practice, uh, you may have more samples for more realistic style of analysis, but the method is the exact same. Then systematic uncertainties. In this case, uh, we hand over an empty list. We say, okay, we don't have any systematic uncertainties. We'll add some in a second, but for the simplest example, let's start without any. And then lastly, one more thing we need to do is we need to define a so-called normalization factor. This is the signal underlying norm thing that I told you before. It's the thing we want to measure. This normalization factor acts on the signal. And what that means is it multiplicatively um, modifies the signal sample 
with some nominal value of one, and this, these are the boundaries um, over which we allow it to vary. And this is the thing we ultimately want to measure. We want to measure what is the normalization of the signal process in the phase-based region that we have specified. So we have a complete conflict, and there's a um, utility here, um, a validation that um, compares this conflict to the JSON schema that Cavalry um, uh, expects. Uh, this is a good thing to check because if this fails, then this is a sign that something went wrong. For example, maybe somewhere we had a typo. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that everything is working well at runtime. There's additional things that could in principle happen at runtime um, that we cannot know at this stage just with static validation. Um, then we're ready with our conflict. There's an overview here so that we can summarize again what's in our conflict. We have three different samples, one phase-based region, one normalization factor, and no systematics. Okay, so with this conflict available now, what do we have to do next? Uh, we need to specify, we need to create histograms that give us the distributions of all of our process in the phase space region that we, that we uh, want to consider. We do this by handing this conflict to Cavendry and to this template builder module to create histograms. We say here that uh, the method we want to use is um, with uproot. So this opens files with uproot, uh, creates histograms with boost histogram, and then saves those to disk. In this case, if you look at the output, you see that we save three different histograms, which are the distributions of our three samples in the one phase space region. Now there's this post-processing step that I'm also going to run uh, at this stage. It's optional, and here it actually doesn't do much. If you scroll down to the extra material, there's an example with a smoothing applied where this post-processing uh, post step uh, will do more. So at this stage, we have a few histograms, and uh, it's a good idea to take a look at those so that we uh, ver uh, verify actually we have defined uh, something sensible. And we do this here with another function that takes again the conflict as input because the conflict includes all the information about all the parts where everything is located now, uh, implicitly defined um, through the structure that you have um, in the conflict itself. We see our histogram here binned in this JetPT observable that uh, we requested with the binning we have requested. Our background sample is shown in blue. The signal process at, uh, contributes mostly at higher Jet PT here in green, and then there's our data shown as well. So, so far, everything looks pretty reasonable. Nothing seems to have gone um, extremely wrong. So we have histograms. Um, to make things a bit more interesting now, um, let's add a few systematic uncertainties um, before we continue with fits. And uh, to give you an example of some systematic uncertainties you might uh, encounter in practice, let's say we have a 5% luminosity uncertainty. So now we update our list of systematics here, and we actually put, fill it with something the first thing here is a systematic we call luminosity uncertainty. It changes the normalization of samples, and it does so um, by 5% in the up and down variations. This is sort of a feature of his factory with how you specify systematics uh, through his factory. We won't have time to go through this in detail. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this more um, after the talk, but this effectively implements the 5% uh, uncertainty for the luminosity. Another uncertainty here is uh, modeling related. Let's say we have our nominal prediction for the background. And then someone else runs a different Monte Carlo simulator and creates a different prediction, and we want to include that also as an uncertainty. We can do so by specifying that for this systematic uncertainty, look in a different tree that's called background underline buried, look at the events there, and build another histogram, and then make a systematic uncertainty out of that. And then lastly, there's a weight based systematic uncertainty where we, instead of using our default weight, which is just called weight, uh, if you scroll further up, uh, we want to replace those weights by other weights, and then we call this in systematic uncertainty as well. So let's update our conflict. Now we have a systematic uncertainties included. Um, and what we need to do is we need to create our histograms again. You see the output this time uh, is longer. We create more histograms because we need new histograms corresponding to the systematic uncertainties that we have just defined. We can visualize um, again the output. This is a different type of visualization now that's specifically for systematic uncertainties. And you see here the two that we have defined, uh, the one where we replace our nominal background modeling by a different, um, which is shown in black, by a different prediction, which is shown here in blue. And at the bottom is showing you the variations under our um, weight modeling systematic in this up and down very, um, direction. So this is useful if to, to ensure we have defined our systematics um, correctly. Uh, and you can see if you change the systematics, how these plots will also be changing. With all our templates available, let's build a workspace out of this. Cavendry does this um, with this workspace module. There's a build function, which you hand again the conflict because the conflict includes all the structure of your model. We save it to disk here. This is optional. We could directly continue with this workspace dictionary instead. All right, so we have the model available and uh, it's time for statistical inference. To do that, we need two things. 
we need a probability density function um, or a PDF, which we'll call model here in the following and the data that we can fit this model to. There's a function to get that. And if you uh, run this now here, you will see that there's a few different modifiers that PyHF uh, creates for us. Some which relate to these parameters that we have specified, our systematic uncertainties, and this signal normalization parameter that we want to measure. There's also a new thing, stat error, that enters here that uh, you might not have expected. This describes the statistical uncertainties of your uh, model prediction, and it's automatically included by cabinetry. It's an important systematic uncertainty to include uh, in practice, and it's done um, automatically for you, so you don't need to worry about it. So the model um, itself is our PDF. What is data? Data is just a list of numbers. Uh, if we really look at it, you see the first four numbers here. These are the counts of data in our four bins. The remaining things are the so-called auxiliary data, uh, which we don't have time to, to go through in any detail now. Check out the PyHF tutorial linked here uh, to learn a bit more about this uh, concept. It's quite important, and we need to pass this auxiliary data around. But unfortunately, there's no time to describe this um, in any detail here. So we have our model, we have our data. So what we can do is we can fit our model to data with this fit function in the Cabinetry fit module. This just um, runs a maximum likelihood estimate. We use um, Minui through the iMinui package to do, do the minimization. We see the result reported here, everything looks okay. And then we see also our parameter values listed at the best fit um, parameter point where we have maximized our likelihood. The results are stored in this fit results object. And this object is a named tuple. And in fact, we can uh, easily do some other things with it. So it has a few properties like dot labels, dot best fit, dot uncertainty to access the results from this fit. So here's a function that shows you to how to access some of this to re um, reproduce here the output of your best fit that was shown here in the log. And you can similarly go ahead and use these um, numbers here um, from, from the results um, to do your own kind of um, uh, your own kind of uh, things that you that you may want to use them in. Instead of just using uh, lo looking at an output, it's often much more helpful to uh, visualize everything. And one thing that we typically visualize with such models is the so-called polls. Uh, so there's a function for this as well, where we pass in our fit results and then we get back a plot like this. Uh, this plot shows us um, nuisance parameters with constraints and how far they have um, been so-called pulled away from their nominal value, which is zero um, for these nuisance parameters and how constrained they have been. Um, constraining here means the uncertainty, which is shown as this bar, uh, becomes smaller than uh, what it is before performing the fit. So our data was sort of sensitive to give us some constraining power over this nuisance parameter. Another thing that's um, very commonly um, looked at uh, to understand the fit a bit better is correlations between different nuisance parameters. You can do that as well, of course. There's a pruning threshold that you can apply here to only include parameters that are, have a minimum correlation with other parameters um, and not look at those that don't matter too much. Um, now, how does our model look like um, after the fit to data? There's a function here that allows you to draw um, the distribution of the model just using information in the workspace. So both this model and the data comes from our workspace, comes from our fit model. We pass in the config here for some um, styling, but this is optional. If we run this, we get uh, yield tables that shows us the counts um, for the different uh, background and signal contributions and of data, including full uh, systematic uncertainty. And there's a figure as well that is produced that shows us now the pre-fit situation before the fit has been performed with quite large uncertainties shown here um, in this uh, with these hashed lines. And we can uh, visualize the same thing after the fit by calling the same function, visualize data underline MC, but passing in our fit results um, tuple here. Um, if we do that now and we can compare uh, the two figures, you see that the uh, uncertainty has significantly reduced um, due to our fit, due to the correlations uh, that have been determined by our fit, and also a bit the um, constraints that have been uh, measured uh, via our fit. Um, and this is now the post-fit um, model, including full systematic uncertainties um, again here. There's a few other things um, that are available in cabinetry, which we don't have much time to go into, but one thing you might um, um, one might be interested in in practice is the so-called Asimov data set. See this paper for some, for some reference here that allows you to evaluate the expected performance of your model. And we can obtain that via a function in this model under the utils um, module within cabinetry. And then if you fit that data set, you see now suddenly all the parameters are either one or zero, which is sort of the defining feature of this Asimov data set. Um, going beyond just simple maximum likelihood estimates, um, cabinetry in includes interfaces uh, for more calculations using um, PyHF to run the calculation internally, but wrapping everything up. 
um, into an interface that uh, reports to you all the things you, you care in practice about usually. Um, you can calculate the discovery significance uh, for our model fitted to data, and we get an expected uh, significance of about one sigma and 1.8 sigma observed because we have a slight excess of signal in our example. Another thing you care about is parameter limits, with, which we've seen in the previous plot, in the previous um, talk, sorry. Um, here we do that by switching out our data. We just pass in a new list of data just to demonstrate that you can easily switch out data if you care about um, the limit for a different set of data. And then we calculate our limits. Um, this uses brand bracketing to um, determine the points where this CLS quantity um, uh, crosses 5%. This is the method that we're using here uh, for the limit calculation. It does so for all the uh, observed and expected limits, and it finally visualizes everything uh, as a function of the signal strength, and it includes your observed and expected limits as well. And then one last thing I want to very briefly mention is um, how we can use cabinetry to um, work with a more fully featured, more realistic um, full-scale atlas analysis. This is a search for electroneutinos linked here, available on HEPData through this link. We download it through PyHF. And we use one of the available signals also again to PyHF, and we save it to disk um, to have it available. Uh, there's a useful utility here, uh, PyHF inspect, that we can use to have a look at what's included here. We see there's eight different channels, 10 samples, 120 parameters. So now this is a model much larger than what we used previously. So this is a more realistic scale. Remember before we had one channel with our toy model, three samples, and uh, I don't know how many parameters, uh, eight, 10, something like this. So this is a much bigger model now. Uh, we can still use cabinetry um, to handle it. So one thing we need is we need to obtain the PDF um, and the data for our model. And with that available, we can visualize everything. Um, so here now, again, we call the, the same function, visualize data uh, MC. And we skip the yield table just because there's lots of different phase space regions and it will be very large. You see there's uh, eight different channels. So we get eight different plots now. And you can look through them afterwards. You see there's sort of signal regions and um, control regions with, with more events here in this example. And um, what we can do is, just as before, we can run again a maximum likelihood fit. Now, this fit takes a few seconds because instead of having just the handful of parameters we had in our toy model, now we have something like 120 parameters. So this is understandably um, a bit slower to run, but it uh, finishes within a few seconds um, still. Um, when we run this fit, we will see all of our best fit parameter results. And this time, for 120 parameters, it will be a very long list. So it's actually very difficult to visually pass. You can scroll through the output here by yourself, and you'll see that there's just a long list of numbers. So it's much more useful now to visualize them. And here you really see the um, power of the visualization. Um, when you see many of those parameters here that are neither constrained nor pulled, and then you see some parameters that might be a bit pulled, like the parameter down here, or some parameters that might be a bit constrained, like some of the parameters here, and then you can focus on those parameters and visually they're very easy um, to, to spot. Um, that's it for the notebook. There's an additional function here if you want to visualize the post-it model. This takes a few seconds, so it's commented out here. And there's much more bonus material at the bottom uh, if you're curious about extra things. Um, but that yeah, it, it concludes the, the main part of what I wanted to show you today. So thanks a lot for following um, along and I'm happy to take um, questions now. I can switch Thanks over so to Slido. Well. Yeah, go through Slido. Thanks. Yes. OK. Is there support for generating toy models and fitting to them? Um, in cabinetry right now, there's not uh, an interface for this, uh, but PyHF has an interface for toys. So at the moment, the way to do this is that um, you create your model, for example, with cabinetry or otherwise, and then you use PyHF um, directly to, um, to, to sample your toys. Um, so. The um, nice thing about cabinetry is that, I mean, there's no barrier with going back to PyHF. There's in fact an example further down in the notebook where you can get, go back and forth. So the, um, the um, objects that we handle uh, at the inference state, which is, which is our PDF, what I call model here and the data, those are exactly the same thing that PyHF handles as well. So instead of using cabinetry to run a fit, you can just as well use uh, PyHF to run a fit. And um, you will see that it's like slightly different uh, with the options that you have available. But um, for the toy models, the, the way to do this right now would be directly to use PyHF. If there's things um, missing there that, that you would like to have packaged up uh, in an interface, uh, please get in touch because uh, I'm sure uh, either the PyHF developers or like through cabinetry, we would be happy to, to implement those to make it um, more user-friendly. Um, okay, currently I have columnar data in another format, uh, Parquet. Is there 
any way to use Kubernetes with that or with pandas dask root data frame in memory. Okay, great question. So at the moment, um, cabin tree only reads root files through this uproot backend. This, however, like in the, in the way everything is written is not really that difficult of a requirement to circumvent. So the, the way things work is the main cabin tree library includes the logic to determine um, which file do you need to look at to build the template histogram that you care about. At the moment, this, this backend with uproot just reads root files. Um, it should be fairly straightforward to add another backend that reads files in a different format and again makes the histogram out of that because that's sort of completely decoupled from all the rest. In fact, uh, you don't even need to import uproot or whatever other dependency you might uh, want to use to read parquet um, if you just use this sort of core functionality. So it's not there at the moment. Uh, I'm happy to um, have something like this included. Uh, and uh, if, you are, if you're interested in this, I mean, please get in touch. Um, everything sort of factors out and um, that should make it quite easy. I should also mention we plan on using, um, on supporting coffee. Uh, I mean, there's in fact, there's an experimental branch that uh, allows this right now. I cannot comment on whether coffee uh, already reads parquet or not. Maybe someone else uh, can know and we can follow up uh, with Slack on this afterwards. But there is no, um, um, no no strict restriction to root files. This is just uh, an implementation detail right now um, because there's a finite amount of backends and um, many people have, uh, use root. So that's the uh, uh, that's that's just uh, yeah uh, a reason. That's the that's the reason for that. Sorry. Um, cabinetry is awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthew. Um, nice talk. You mentioned that cabinetry is integrated with coffee. Um, when do you expect to have it available? Okay, that's a very good question, and uh, I will link to you uh, on Slack afterwards um, some more details about this. Uh, in principle, the uh, current uh, integration could already be merged. I was hoping to improve it a bit, um, and the reason for that is mostly that the to, to really take full advantage of coffee, we want to run as many things in parallel as possible. And that requires some slight refactoring that uh, unfortunately before PyHub uh, didn't happen. Um, there is a lot of potential to um, do some clever things that are requiring code that doesn't exist at the moment um, to use coffee really to, ex to its uh, maximum capabilities. And this GitHub issue on the, uh, this GitHub discussion on coffee that I'll link to you afterwards uh, goes into some detail there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm expecting that uh, coffee itself, I mean, we should have this uh, available within the next month or so. Um, the, a, a nicer version where we can really uh, use the coffee to its largest um, capabilities might take a bit longer because there's some more work um, to be done there. Um, okay, thanks. Another question. Does it handle multidimensional histograms and PDFs? Um, no. Um, at the moment, everything is one dimensional, and this is a restriction of the his factory model itself that uh, we're following. Um, there are ideas of um, going to some sort of extension of a his factory model to have some his factory version 2.0 or, or something like that, where we could relax these sort of requirements. At the moment, this is a hard requirement. Um, if you have multi dimensional distributions, one thing you can do is if you have, for example, a two-dimensional distribution, you can break this down into multiple one-dimensional distributions and fit those. Um, because in the end, it doesn't matter so much whether, whether bins are adjacent to each other or not, because you just look at each bin individually. It does matter slightly if you do things like smoothing, but otherwise um, um, it doesn't. So um, it's currently a, a limitation of the model that um, we don't, don't go to multiple dimensions. 